work in the same department. Um, I'm actually from the Northeast. I'm from Pennsylvania, so I did my training at Loyola University in Maryland. I'm very happy to be in Texas, and Baylor is a really great institution. We have so many resources, so it's a really good opportunity to learn and to train and um, to experience a whole variety of patients and families and people with um, all different backgrounds as well. So I'm really excited to be here. Thanks for having me. My name is Christina, if we have to be formal, but you can call me Christy. I um, have 12 years of experience. I've worked in a variety of different settings. Um, outpatient was a little bit new to me, and it's been a great um, transition and a way to work with a different variety of patients, and I really enjoy helping patients get back to their prior level of functioning as much as we can. Um, as many of you may have gone through the different continuum of care, when we were putting this together, the reason that we wanted to have sort of a panel is for you to have an opportunity to ask us different questions and that we could break up kind of the rehab process into some different sections. So we hope that what we have to talk about today will be enlightening and helpful. And please raise your hand if you have any additional questions. And we're happy to be here. This I'm a speech pathologist. I am so sorry. Um, yes, I have been in a hospital setting my entire career, but fairly new to outpatient in 2015. So um, we see a variety of different neuro type patients at our clinic, and we are happy to be here. very closely together. So we wanted to give you a whole introduction to the multidisciplinary care that we can provide with all three therapies, all three services. Um, and all, the model that we use a lot of times is trying to get our patients in kind of in a block so they can see physical, occupational, and speech therapy all in the same day and you can work as a team to provide the most comprehensive care we can. So um, this is just the way that we consider um, each individual and their impairments or their deficits as we get started with therapy. So um, this is a nice little picture of the brain. It kind of points. Great. So our main goal is to try to identify what each person is coming to us with, what kind of issues they might be having or changes they might be experiencing. And a lot of times what we find is that different areas of the brain are going to result in a different type of impairment, different strengths, and different weaknesses. So we all take that into consideration when we're starting our treatment and going through and recognizing that if we come, a patient comes with, to us with a diagnosis of encephalitis, we have to really think about what that means for each patient. It's not going to be the same thing every time, and we want to be treating based on what we see and what you're telling us. So something that we really take into consideration when developing our treatment plan is recognizing that our goal might not necessarily be to get you back to functioning the exact same way that you were functioning before, but really finding good ways to make you be able to participate and complete the same activities that you were doing prior to all of the deficits that you experience. So it might be um, changing the way that you go about things or getting supports in different ways, but our biggest goal is to have you be as safe independent as possible with your life and getting back to your daily routine. So that's something that comes from you to help us say, okay, what is my goal in therapy? How can I um, help you to get back to that sort of level? So we're going to talk a little bit about each discipline, so I'll give you the key. Okay, so just as a brief overview based on the American Physical Therapy Association, the vision of PT is to transform society by optimizing movement to improve the human experience. So we think of the movement system as a combination of all of the different systems in our body, whether it's the cardiovascular, the nervous system, the musculoskeletal system, the integumentary system, they all have to work together in order to have the most efficient movement that we can. So then when we're looking at PT, some of the main goals that we have are to maximize quality of life by restoring, maintaining, of course, promoting mobility and functional ability. And so um, pain is another one of the most common uh, complaints that people have, so we definitely do address that as well through different uh, treatments. Um, and so that's not always the primary goal, but we always ask about that because that does, um, it's an important thing to address. So some of the most important focuses when it comes with physical therapy after a 
brain injury, this is not all encompassing for physical therapy um, in itself as a discipline, but when it comes to brain injury, I would say fall prevention, improving mobility, enhancing cardiovascular fitness and posture re-education, as well as pain and some of the other things that I will address later when we talk about treatment. So as we've talked about so far, we're along the continuum of care in an outpatient setting, and myself being a speech pathologist, work very closely with PT and OT, and speech in particular has a lot of crossover between OT, and so we have to really communicate what it is that we're working on. So to go off of Katie's model, the vision with occupational therapy, and this is also taken from the uh, American Occupational Therapy Association. Helping people across a lifespan to return to previous activities after injury due to physical and cognitive changes to maximize independence. As we know with encephalitis, a lot of times there's cognitive deficits. So what are the activities of daily living that may be limited due to, could be um, upper body and lower body weakness, it could be difficulty with coordination and strength of those extremities. It, may, it could be difficulty with dressing, grooming, bathing, um, with a progression towards um, what we call complex activities of daily living, which could be cooking and eventually driving, which is always a goal that patients express to us as being a desired activity. So the focus of occupational therapy is very holistic and they look at um, the use of the environment to fit the person, and a lot of times adaptive equipment is part of the therapy process and identifying what equipment may be, need to be needed in order to maximize independence, and then what additional strategies or compensation may be um, required in order to maintain safety. So across speech, occupational, and uh, physical therapy, our number one goal is safety and how we can help have caregivers and family members support that in the process as independence continues to increase. Long in a conversation. So the language is the meaning of what's being said. Um, and then lastly, we have communication. So that's like our overarching, uh, that encompasses all of those things. Can I use my speech? Do I use language appropriately to communicate with other people? Can I interact and exchange ideas and be social? Um, and ultimately, what we want is independence with those things, that if you have a need that's not being met, you can communicate that to somebody that can help you do it. If you have a thought, an idea, you're able to participate in a conversation and form social relationships and maintain your relationships by communicating in that way. So that's, um, yes? Uh, one question. So aphasia would be language, and it's, it's both, you know, speech, so we would consider that a speech therapy idea, because um, aphasia is the loss of language, so receptive and expressive language, and it could come either way that um, they're not able to find the words, or they're not able to understand what others are saying. So the next uh, portion of that would be cognitive therapy. So um, again, aiming to increase independence and support uh, thinking skills that often support communication. So the term cognitive communication <coughs> there is a really integral one for speech therapists because when we look at cognition, we're looking at how does that support the individual's ability to communicate with other people. So if you have an attention deficit or a memory impairment, often you're not gonna be able to remember the things that you need to do or even if you understand what somebody's saying, are you gonna remember that tomorrow? Are you gonna be able to take that instruction and follow through with it? So we're looking at a holistic idea. Yeah, maybe you can participate in a conversation with me right now and it looks normal, but do you take that information and make it meaningful, apply it to your daily life and really use it the best way that you can, how you did before the diagnosis. So as a speech language pathologist, we're looking at all of those, those components of communication and trying to identify what specifically is having, is giving you trouble and how we can work on those skills to support the entire communication exchange with both new and familiar people. So it's really 
can you work with your family, can you work with your caregivers, but can you be successful in the community and interact with the cashier or um, your server at a restaurant or somebody at Comcast to figure out what your phone bill is going to be like. So it's all types of things. Are you able to use those skills successfully? Any questions about the disciplines in itself? Is there a, is there a different kind of training that a specific cognitive therapist would have, have other than the training you guys have had? So speech language pathology is very broad in our schooling we are required to touch upon all areas of speech and all areas of cognition and all areas of what we just defined as being executive functioning. It really depends on what setting that you choose to work in, where you really get more of the hands-on training. Once we finish our master's degree, we complete what we call a clinical fellowship year in which we are supervised by a supervisor for nine months, but we are operating as an independent therapist with that supervision support. It is a difficult process to find a medical setting that will support you in that, and they're very competitive positions. And most people that have done those fellowships end up staying in a medical setting and finding a specific focus. We could have a whole lecture today about voice therapy. I am not specifically trained in that. That is a completely different area. Um, that doesn't mean that they're not a speech language pathologist providing that care in a different setting. But our discipline is extremely wide variety because we could have a whole discussion about pediatric brain injury, which is a completely different, uh, not that it's different therapy, but it's different training, it's different models, it's different, um, a different focus. Does that answer your question? A cognitive, the other piece of that that I want to mention, we do not have a neuropsychologist with us today, but we could add another chair and they would be right here with us. And oftentimes the cognitive therapy, the recommendation for that therapy to a speech language pathologist may have been identified by a neuropsychologist during a full battery of testing. And we are the ones to implement strategies and to try different techniques to see if we can help with increasing independence. Let me just ask the question another way. Is there a, is there a cognitive therapist that would have not, not had the training you guys have had, but had a different kind of training? No. We are basically cognitive therapists, and that's where Rachel was talking about cognitive communication. That term is often misunderstood that we're speech pathologists. And people come to us and say, well, I can speak. So then that's when we have to go in to explain that speech pathology is also cognition. But it really depends on what setting that you're in as to if you're going to be addressing cognition. I know that that's a little bit muddy. I, don't, I hope that that clarifies. Anybody else? Okay, so now we're just going to go into the, this is what we call the ICF model, the International Classification of Functioning, Disability, and Health model. It was created by the World Health Organization, and it's just a way that as different disciplines, we can talk through this as a way to conceptualize how someone is going about their daily life and um, from their health condition, what body functions and structures of the body are affected, then what parts of the activities of their daily life of an individual are affected. So think of like the ING words, walking, dressing, grooming, problem solving, etc. And then participation, so what roles do they have that are affected? And then we also have here at the bottom, personal factors and environmental factors. And so this is a very interactive um, and multidimensional model that we just try to look at. So if we ask you a million questions on day one of therapy, it's just to help us understand how we can help you in these different areas and help you towards your goals and maybe some things that you don't see that are um, maybe problems that we can help you towards. So more specifically, just as examples, so again, the body structures and functions, you think of the structures as, yes, the parts of the body that are affected, um, but then here are some functions. So of a muscle, we have strength, power, endurance, um, and balance, and all those things, including sensation, and plenty of other things go into how we're able to walk. So how we're able to walk then and take care of ourselves um, then affects how well we're able to take care of ourselves as well as um, those around us, if you are a mom dad and take care of your kids um, and so some of those participation roles are then affected 
So oftentimes in our evaluation, we ask questions about what patients did before, what they're currently doing, and what they would want to do. As was asked about aphasia, I'm going to choose communication under the body structures and function, another medical term that we use to define that of communication is aphasia, which is receptive and expressive language. In order to be able to understand and participate and volunteer to attend church or to be a good wife or a good husband, is that I have to be able to understand what people are telling me, I have to be able to find the words. Therefore, our therapy is focused on activities such as reading and writing, it may even be conversational speech, it may be role playing, it may be able to figure out what are the strategies that are needed in order to resume those activities. So we often work on skills that would be me giving you a few commands and seeing if you can follow them. It may be actually participating in a conversation, but then if you're having trouble with those activities, it may be that you need the words to be said to you a little bit slower or you may need to have it repeated. And so it's working on all of those different skills and strategies that are gonna help you be able to resume and participate in the things that you desire. And one of the things that makes us um, understand patients better is we have to know what's important to you so that we can design our treatment plan regarding the outline of those activities because that's what's gonna help you see that you're making progress. Then just briefly about the personal factors and environmental factors. So there are some things in our life that are fixed and some that are more variable. So our age, our gender, those are of course things that are fixed that we can't change. Um, then we have other personal factors including family support. Do you live with anybody? So that also goes under the environmental factor. Um, do you have family in the area that can help you drive you, that can help drive you to therapy or take you to the store to get your groceries? Um, again, the transportation, or if you do not, how are you going to come to therapy? How are you going to get around to do those um, participation roles? Are you going to use DART or other um, community type resources to, or whether it's Uber? So there's plenty of different ways to use transportation. Um, other things include, um, like your education prior to injury, that does play a role, um, maybe where we're headed, as well as like their, uh, the work environment, and then other lifestyle habits, motivation, personality traits, and again that awareness comes back into play, whether someone um, will come into therapy and um, a lot of times they'll go into speech therapy and say that their goal is to walk, and they're like, great, that's, that's really important, don't get me wrong, but let's talk about some other things because motivation for each therapy is really important. We don't want you just to have one specific goal, which is it's good to have goals, but we also need to address um, different things in each therapy. Um, insurance is also another um, factor that we do have to address. Um, and whether with some insurances we only have um, so many visits to address these things. And so otherwise we really have to emphasize the home exercise program in other ways. Um, that way we get you in the therapy as much as we can, but also go towards those goals as quickly that we can. Um, again, the environmental factors, so are you living with anybody? Do you live in a safe neighborhood? Can you walk around um, your neighborhood when I ask you to go for a five to 10 minute walk each day or every other day? Is it a safe place or do we need to talk about maybe um, going to the mall with a friend? Or things like that as well as other access to resources. Any questions about that? The goal really, I'm gonna keep using the word safe, but that is one of our biggest goals. Um, does that make sense? And so they may not walk um, like they used to walk. Um, we try to make uh, it, you know, the prettiest walk that we can get, um, but it's not always gonna be what they used to look like when they were walking. Um, so of course, yes, we look at taking equal stride length and making sure that we're um, putting enough weight onto the side, because a lot of times after a brain injury or any sort of injury, they don't wanna put weight onto that side, so they'll walk kind of like this, not put weight onto that side. And so then we work on just body awareness, midline awareness, helping them to realize where in space their body is, how to have equal weight, as if we've got 50% of our weight on each leg on a scale. Um, and then working on weight shifting and taking enough, um, putting enough weight onto that side as we're walking. And so all those things kind of play a role. 
mean, walking is a big goal in itself. We can break that down into many other different components. Does that make sense? It I didn't makes, talk about someone specifically, but. It makes a lot of sense. I think for the, some of the people I don't know, know in the room, left, right, hemisphere challenges might be a really common thing. So thank you for the optical one. I haven't heard that in a long time, and I remember it. Thank you. Of course. Any other questions about that? Um, I, I was just uh, wanted to add something, which is for some of us who have an autoimmune form of encephalitis, um, the, the injury is not a, located in a particular spot of the brain. It's a diffuse problem that's kind of all over the place, and it has to do with the communication <coughs> within the brain. Absolutely. And so is that part of, you, you guys learn about that, and do you take that into account? Yes, the different injuries. So yes, actually, if y'all just went through that training of talking about different types of injuries, including that diffuse um, type of injury. And so, um, <coughs> yes, with someone like that, it's not going to be maybe as obvious. They may have more impairments, that including fatigue when they're walking, or just not as efficient, or um, dizziness, or other sort of things that um, maybe more kind of global versus one side that looks more obvious to someone that doesn't know them. Um, but yes, absolutely helping someone to be the most efficient um, with their walking or just talking about energy um, conservation strategies or different things like that to help them get through their day the most effective and efficient. Um, because yes, it's not, one person does not look like the other, absolutely. Does that make sense? Yeah. <coughs> I'm sure a lot of people in our room have, like me, chronic fatigue after this disease. Can you speak to that at all? I mean, in, in terms of exercise and therapy, I got tired of walking around in this room for you. I don't tell them. So. Absolutely. And I mean, a chronic fatigue is something that I'm not going to fix overnight or help someone get through overnight. It's not, um, like you said, it's chronic. And so there's a lot of different things that we talk about. Um, maybe compensatory strategies, meaning how can we, again, be the most effective with our with our energy throughout the day? When do you feel the most energy? Some people are morning people, some are night. Um, so just the idea of doing certain things, maybe sitting down. Maybe I used to fold clothes standing up, but maybe now I should fold clothes while sitting down. That's the most energy efficient for me at this time. Or like going up and down stairs. Maybe I used to go up one foot to each step. But maybe that requires too much energy of me now, and so maybe I should definitely use the handrail for safety um, and be bring two feet to each step um, and work on our breathing and other strategies that help us to, again, be the most energy efficient. Um, and also fatigue, just talking about sleep habits and um, other things that definitely play a role in um, fatigue. Um, does that make sense? It's hard to um, answer specifically, but yes, we definitely do address I just wanted to make a plea. You all are, are presenting some very valuable information. Um, half of us are caregivers and half of us are survivors. It's really difficult to follow at the speed in which you're presenting it. Okay. So if there's any way to go a little slower, yes, we want do. to take it in. Absolutely. I'm sorry about that. But <laughs> sometimes we're, I, I'm stuck on uh, what you just said and you're saying something else is valuable and I'm missing the second one. Can I repeat anything for you? Okay. <laughs> yes. At all, is it possible for us to have access to the, the slides or the handouts? Yes, absolutely. We'll send it over to. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Great. Yes. Once you have done rehabilitation and you've gained ground, are we more susceptible to the if you don't use it, you lose it? So if you've gained ground, do you need to continue mindfully with? Different therapies or exercise, or would it be to occasionally go back and redo things? Or? Well, you just touched on one of our favorite slogans, use it or lose it, um, for sure. So it's something that we think throughout therapy is really important to remember and why we focus so much on <coughs> developing a home exercise program for long time, long term carryover. Because the more you practice the therapy, <coughs> pardon me, the more benefit hopefully that you'll get. It's not just going to be that one hour of speech therapy twice a week that we're hoping to do. We're hoping to establish a good routine at home and in the community with that one hour of training that you can take and practice between sessions and then establish and move on going forward. 
So if we're successful, we can establish a good routine for you, some good strategies, some good modifications and compensations that you take with you long term. So you are using those day in and day out to complete every activity that you need. Um, and hopefully, you know, you don't need to come back for more therapy over and over because we've established a good routine and a good skill set that you can use moving forward and um, kind of make it second nature that you're kind of using and practicing and exercising every day, but you don't have to think, I need to do my exercises today. You're actually going through that as part of um, your, your daily, daily schedule. Physical therapy. Oh, I'm sorry. I was going to pass the microphone for more questions. Yeah. And also, I'll touch on physical therapy. Um, one of the biggest goals for physical therapy um, in itself is to be somewhat where someone is coming in maybe every year, um, just so that we can come in and check in with you and see how you're doing. Is there little things that we can change? Our posture changes over time. Maybe we're not. Maybe we're not taking big enough steps anymore. Maybe now we're shuffling. So. Physical therapy in itself, like yes, sometimes it's right after the injury, but um, we also love that if you want to come in and check in with us, I'm not saying come back every month or so, but um, we'd love to see you again because let's see if there's any things that we can work on. Maybe you've um, surpassed what we sent you home with with your home exercise program, and now you're on to bigger and better things, and maybe we can give you harder exercises. Um, and so just the idea of, like, yes, we would like to keep checking in, that it's not just a one-time Um, I was back uh, ways back on cognitive functioning. How as a caregiver, how as a caregiver can you help uh, your loved one to acknowledge or recognize a deficiency? Because as a caregiver, it kind of sounds negative. You said, I know this, you're not doing this, or you're doing this. very happy to have this because it really guides what we want to share with you. We did, um, that's kind of our next portion too, but I do think, especially with the population that needs family support or has really wonderful family support, we absolutely encourage that participation in the therapy sessions um, so that we can identify as a group, what are the limitations that you're experiencing? How can you get feedback from the patient and from a caregiver to say, do we think this is really your function at home? Because a lot of times we see patients that aren't doing as well monitoring their own performance, and they might not be as aware of their function as before. Um, so it, sometimes we can say, you know, do you think that you could uh, cook a whole meal by yourself? And our patient will say, absolutely. And the family will say, I don't think so. <laughs> so we can say, okay, let's talk through that and break it down, you know, as we were just talking about what skills are required to cook your dinner. Do you think you could stand for 30 whole minutes walking around the kitchen? Maybe not. Okay. Do you think, and kind of walk through that so that the patient starts to realize, yeah, those things might be more challenging for me. And the caregiver isn't the one saying, if you're not safe, get out of the kitchen, this is my job now, but saying, how can we figure that out? If you are gonna help me out in the kitchen, like Katie said, I'm gonna set you down at the table. You can sit here and chop up some vegetables and we can work together instead of saying, you're not allowed to do this or I don't feel comfortable with you. So you can work together to really identify what specifically might be having causing that problem and then establishing a good um, rapport together to figure out how we can build on that and step-by-step -step improve. Well, now in my situation,
safety concerns? No, just in just in general is is the positive growth of, of the cognitive functioning. I know where she was before, and I see that she has grown immensely. But I see some limitations, and I know some uh, some areas that are still weak. And she's talking about at work doing something. It's not up to me to decide her her ability, but I can see some areas that might cause some negative outcomes, but she doesn't. So these are really great questions. It's a, it, these are some complicated answers, but I wanted to kind of circle back around to a few of the questions that have been asked to kind of go to your point. Something that I really emphasize with family and caregivers and patients in the early stages with therapy is, is that we need to establish a structured routine and we need to establish a structured schedule. And part of the cognitive research and what, the, what we know about the brain is that it needs consistency. And going back to the fatigue question, it's, it's identifying what activities are really important for that person and what, how many of those tasks that need to be done, whether it's during the day or whether it's during the week. And I always talk to families about spacing those out over the course of the week. And if you're only able to do two of those, then you move those other three to another day. And there is nothing wrong with breaking your day down into having naps. And it's notorious, what we know about the brain is that you're gonna do much better in the morning than you're gonna do later at night. And if we had a neuropsychologist here, they would be talking to you about brain health, and they would be talking to you about sleep and nutrition. And those are two very important elements that going to bed, getting up at the same time are very, very important for consistency. And part of our goal as a cognitive therapist, since that is kind of a loose term and hard to define is trying to establish these recommendations because a lot of these things I'm mentioning to you may have been written in a neuropsychology report. Therefore, as a speech language pathologist, our job is to be able to put that into motion. And so that structured schedule routine may, may change. And going back to the safety concern about referring to work, it's identifying in the now what can we do now? And trying to, to really reiterate, these are the short term goals that need to be consistent to get us closer to this. And part of what we do is maybe have patients come to us with OT and PT and speech, where we can identify those activities and even do those activities with the patient. So then that way with the patient and the caregiver, we can provide education and training. And I'll use the example of cooking, because that comes up a lot, is maybe we actually have a patient cook for us and we are able to give education to them about that actual activity and how can we facilitate back what Rachel was saying. Maybe you sit at the table and you cut the lettuce and the tomatoes and the carrots, but then you're able to stand for 15 minutes and mix the salad and bake the meat and all of that. Um, I guess I want to go to your question, Mr. Robert, about families, and I want to make sure that there was something, was there something today that you really felt like you needed an answer on? I just survived. Okay. 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 Um, yes? Oh, get the mic here. We were, we were really kind of, we were trying to summarize a presentation for 60 minutes and really not knowing 100% of our audience. So I appreciate you guys raising your hand and interrupting us because it's, this is a, we could have a whole discussion this afternoon about this. Well, we, we, we appreciate your tailoring, your responses to our questions. That's very, uh, if we could talk about the, the speech, language, cognition for a minute. Uh, in my particular, I'm a caregiver, uh, and with my sister, has no trouble 
speaking. No problem with enunciation. No problem with pronunciation. Nothing. But getting her to be an involved in a conversation is extremely difficult. You have to challenge her in order for her to respond to a question, and you really have to work hard at you know, the conversational back and forth, which she does not want to participate in. Uh, any ideas or comments about all of that? Yes, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go back to the young lady that was in the back that raised her hand and asked a little bit about um, use it or lose it. So going back to our goals that we identify in the very beginning, this is why it's so important in knowing what's important to the patient and like Rachel mentioned, where we have that gap in between therapy to try certain things out, sometimes the brain only has so much mental energy that it can use, and without going into a lot of detail about executive functioning, but what we call cognitive flexibility, and so that's the ability to go from one task to another. And so if that gas tank I use this a lot, if that gas tank is empty and engaging in conversation is really demanding, the engagement of that is going to be really hard. So trying to simplify those conversations, maybe one-on-one, -on -one, maybe in a less demanding environment, and building up to more extreme may make it a little bit easier. But you have to think about all the other factors that are going on that may be influencing a response, not just not being able to think of the words, but are we playing music in the background? Is, are there a, is there a lot of action going on where there's, we're at a party and we're trying to interact? Um, sometimes the structured part of it in a one-on-one -on -one setting may be easier to build up towards being able to engage at a louder restaurant with six or eight other people. Well, I was talking about, you know, the one-on-one -on -one conversation. But something you said uh, triggered this. Perhaps my goal of wanting her to be more facilitated and fluent in the back and forth conversational exchange, do I need to lower those expectations? Is it okay to lower them? Well, there's two different types of conversation. There's the ability for us to initiate and express our ideas and details and opinions versus our ability to participate in conversation. And so maybe the goal right now is really just to be able to participate. So I'm gonna say yes, I think it's okay. I don't think you're doing anything less to not have that goal. But I think knowing what's feasibly possible about what the brain can do and finding that gray area of pushing, because family members are classic cheerleaders and we love you. And couldn't do our job without you. Um, I don't even know why that makes me cry. But I, mean, I, <laughs> um, I had some phenomenal stories in my career of family members that really made the difference. And so it is not you that's putting, that's expecting less. It's that you have to think about what the brain is capable of doing. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Um, I'd like to take a minute to quickly respond to that. Um, I have uh, personal experience with uh, language difficulty. I suffered from the same type of encephalitis that George's sister has. And mine is a diffuse type problem. And I will tell you this, when I first got sick, um, in addition to having trouble articulate clearly, which some of you who saw me at the first few conferences remember when I could barely make a sentence. But in addition to that, there was what you were talking about in there is this sort of, can you initiate conversation? Can you initiate ideas? And it, for me, when I first got sick, when I was critically ill, there was just this deafening silence in my head and there was, you know, I couldn't think of anything to say and even if someone asked me a question, I might or might not truly process the question. And then if I had any thoughts in response, and my thoughts were really slow and you know, vacant compared to my pre-morbid self, 
um, it, it was just <laughs> such a struggle, and it was so exhausting to try not to so much the speaking, but just coming up with an idea and trying to turn the idea into words. I mean, we all, this is such an automatic process, right, for most of us, but after encephalitis, it can turn into a very mechanical exercise that you actually have to work through. It's like you gotta come up with an idea in response to this question. Then you gotta find some words to put it together, and then you gotta say it, and it's exhausting. So, and you have such limited amount of brain energy. So, anyway, my personal experience. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so glad that you touched on that, because that's kind of exactly what I was thinking about, and that diffuse type of injury that we see so often with encephalitis really results in slower processing speed, and it talks so much to the cognitive aspects of communication. So, if you are able to participate in a conversation, because you can take words and understand them and formulate a response, like you said, before having any variety of illness or injury, it's so second nature. We don't think at all about how much it goes into that. But it's not just, do you understand the language and can you formulate a message? It's, can you follow that speed of conversation? Can you quickly formulate a response? Can you use your motor skills to communicate it to somebody else? Can you weed out the distractions, even of the cars passing by outside? That's a great example when the TV is on. You know, we, we do that. We leave the TV on all day, but then when you're home, it's like, that is all I can think about. Like, turn that off. I can't process anything else. So that slow processing speed, in my opinion, is a huge limitation for almost everything else, and especially with communication, because we do expect that when we ask a question, we're getting a response right away. We're almost preparing for what that person's going to say, and we have our next response ready to go. When you have this slow processing speed, you're still on step one trying to understand and process what words were just thrown in your direction, then apply meaning to them, then identify how you're supposed to respond, and then formulate a response. Yeah, I just want to echo the slow processing speed for me has been the biggest challenge. My processing speed has come up now, but at the first few years, it was so slow, and that was indeed, it impacted that, it impacted everything, really. And it, it, I think so, this is kind of where we were headed with speech and cognition as well. And if you look kind of at the bottom section here, we focus on two things with speech therapy, technically, I mean, broad categories. We're looking at uh, compensatory strategies, modifications to the way you did things versus restorative training. And when you have, when you're suffering with slow processing speed, we're trying to build from the bottom in a hierarchy to get you to that level where you feel comfortable uh, navigating all of those cognitive demands while participating in conversation, while multitasking, you know, and doing all those things. So the very basic skill we need to establish first is making sure you do know, understand what's coming in and formulate an appropriate response. Then maybe we'll add a distraction. You know, we're sitting in a quiet room, but we turn on the radio on low. So we're still having a simple conversation, but now we have to, to weed out that distraction. Then maybe we'll take that into a restaurant, you know, and we're still having the conversation, but there's a lot more going on. I mean, you know, thinking about, okay, now we're in the car, and you're thinking about what's going on. You're, there's a lot of noise, there's a lot of visual stimulus, and you still have to participate. So we're building on those skills and increasing the challenge as we go so that your communication skills might be effective when it's one-on-one -on -one in a quiet environment, but now we're gonna challenge that and train you to use them in functional places. Because again, before all of this started for you, going out to a restaurant and engaging with 10 people at a table might have been exhausting, but it certainly wasn't this exhausting and almost insurmountable. Whereas we can make that, train those skills and help you figure out how to navigate them in a way that's actually successful and efficient and it doesn't make you just sit there and be drained by <coughs> following along with everything people are saying. Uh, to continue with this same conversation, when you're having those, I, I totally get what you're saying about the environment. Oh my gosh, yes. <laughs> but when you're talking about these one-on-one, -on -one, when you're 
just trying to get a conversation. Still today, for me, as soon as people ask questions where there's a lot of possibilities for an answer, almost zero, I mean, that like brings out the vacancy in your head. And, um, so for anything, when there's a lot of possibilities, if you can narrow it down to just a couple. A, a guy named Damon used to talk on our Inspire thing and say, as a caregiver, we, you don't say, what do you want for lunch? You say, oh, hot dog. Yeah, can you, <laughs> yeah, you can have a hamburger or a hot dog, which do you want? And that just narrows it down so much you can respond to it. And I think even with just trying to have a little conversation, you keep that in mind, that just this simplicity is super helpful. But what I'm wondering that I never can figure out from living and is, is it good to keep going until you hit the wall or is it important to, to stop before the gas tank is empty? It, it is a balance and we're trying to continually push that wall. But if you get to that wall, you're dropping and the, the challenge to get back to that level is a lot harder. Then if you get kind of close and you can say, I am really tired right now. And to Christy's point, I'm gonna rest. I'm gonna close my eyes for five minutes and recharge. You might have dropped a little bit in your energy level, but you can build it up a lot more quickly than if you hit that wall and you're at the floor. So we're always trying to find that balance because if you stop too early every time, you're not challenging yourself. You're not building on that tolerance. But if you can identify where the limitation is, give yourself the rest, and then push forward, you're going to make more progress. And I think realizing the next day, if you push yourself too far, is your next day going to be as successful as your, the one you just had? Let's even say if you push yourself too hard, is that even successful? You know, like I'd rather leave some energy in the tank to reflect on the day and say, what did we accomplish? How maybe can I do better the next day? Um, and to realize kind of those short-term goals and long-term goals that we don't have to address everything today and to push things back sometimes and be patient with ourselves. Talk on her slide, but to answer your question, 
Um, I think it's more of what are the continued long-term goals? What are the limitations that may be impeding the ability to resume that? And is there enough substantial progress that could be made to move towards that? And oftentimes we get referrals for speech therapy that they have that a neurologist has identified, and they really don't know whether or not progress can be made. And all we, as long as we can get the right doctor and the right support, and ethically we can, we can write in our professional license what it allows us to do to support for treatment, we can always try. Um, it's better to try than not try, um, and to see what additional training that we can provide that may move you further along. physician like your primary care or your cardiologist, somebody who you see frequently, who sees you, who knows how you're doing, they know what you need, they will do the referral to the nervous site. And that's what I've done rather than through my neurologist. My neurologist says, you know, I have epilepsy also, so he knows he's like, okay, here's, here's your any epileptics, thank you. So I think that, that's my Whereas if their husband says to them, your eyes are drooping, they're like, okay. 
on to the next one. I'm still working right now. So having a therapist maybe say that and help you monitor it, help you identify your own personal you know, indications that I'm about to hit that wall so that we can find a way to stop it is really important. What I hear a lot is, you don't understand I have a deadline. Yeah, that's true. I need to finish. I need to finish. Well, also, the other reality is if you don't finish, you might actually remember what you can do. <laughs> it will take you twice as long to reestablish yeah. everything. Yeah. So it's oh. a fine balance there because, uh, yeah. I have a very different I appreciate you putting these diagnosis codes up here for the whatever you call them. Yeah. Because so many of our doctors don't know, and I've told you all this before you started, right? Many of our doctors don't prescribe the therapy that we need. So having these codes are perfect. The question is, are these specific to speech, language, so this is or is this in perfect segue. Thank you. I think this speaks to also what Dale was saying, that sometimes if you notice that there's something that you need consult with you need help with, going to any doctor that can refer you to a neurologist or a neuropsychologist or write a script for physical, occupational, or speech therapy is exactly what we need. So if you look at the very first point there, physical and occupational therapy can actually complete an evaluation without a doctor's order. So you can come in, you can schedule an appointment, the physical therapist will do their evaluation, they'll identify with you your points of need and then establish a plan of care that gets sent to the physician for approval. So we are getting that doctor's approval to initiate therapy, but we're, we don't need that for evaluation. I can't treat you on the first day, but I can start seeing you on that first day without the order. On the flip side, speech pathology cannot do anything, any more variety of evaluation or treatment unless we get a, a doctor's prescription with a good code. So these are just two examples, um, but the reason I included those is because and, um, we have like a whole bank of codes. When I typed in encephalitis, as you know, there's 10 million forms of encephalitis, and I'm not gonna be able to tell you which one it is. So that, um, I chose the most broad codes, other encephalitis or other encephalopathy. So the doctor is the one who's gonna be able to assign that code metabolic encephalopathy. So, you know, those things are helpful to us because it can kind of define maybe what you are struggling with, what your course of treatment has been so far, medically speaking, um, and gives us a little bit of guidance to how we're gonna form that treatment. So those codes will demonstrate a neurological impairment, a brain injury, that deficit. And then we, during our evaluation, will work with you to decide, is this also a cognitive communication impairment? Is this patient presenting with aphasia? Is this person presenting with left-sided weakness or dizziness? And we can establish those codes as well. So it's really important for speech for you to go in if you need something and talk to family doctor, cardiologist, neurologist, whoever you have access to and a good relationship with, and request a, uh, an evaluation and a treatment um, prescription, and if you can think of it, asking and recommending that they include a code that identifies that you have encephalitis or that you have encephalopathy and what what you are medically diagnosed with. So when you get to the treatment session, we can really work with you and say, okay, maybe when you first were here, you needed help with walking. Now we're gonna target your dizziness. Or maybe when you first were here, you had aphasia, and we really got those communication skills going, but after getting back into your life, living for a year, you realize that you have a lot more problem solving or decision making, verbal reasoning issues that you want to address, and that could be our next stage of the therapy program. And I will say insurance likes the most specific code, so others preferably ask for the most specific, but. <laughs> right, those, that's what I included because I can't tell you what all of you might be diagnosed with. Most Just a follow-up comment on that. I'm curious uh, other people's experiences. Uh, with some follow-up care on my end for the residuals, I was rejected for putting all these codes in because they went and said, well, you know, these codes are for an active infection. You know, you have no signs of active infection. You know, these codes aren't relevant. So I actually got some occupational therapy by, you know, uh, my doctor and therapist saying I needed speech therapy just leaving it at that. So 
I'm curious if anybody else has had that experience because of our insurance said, well, you've got no sign of active infection. These codes are invalid. We're not going to cover this. But I, I was just going to add, um, my doctor uses the other encephalopathy code because in my case, I do not have an active infection. I never had an infection. I had an autoimmune form. Mm -hmm. So the encephalopathy, and so far, we've been successful. That, that actually is why I need to do that because I know we're at an encephalitis conference, but the encephalopathy is what we're going to look at and say there are changes in the brain. So the encephalitis causes an encephalopathy, and now we have this neurological change, this brain-based deficit that's presenting itself in a communication disorder or a dizziness, you know. So we are looking at in the hospital, when you're in the hospital with doctors and nurses and hooked up to all these cords, you're being treated for encephalitis. When you come back for rehab three months or six months or six years later, we're looking at encephalopathy, the changes in the brain function that are resulting in participation deficits in your, in your daily life. It's kind of going way back because it was hitting the wall. So I don't want to confuse too many brains. I want to say um, thank you very much for recognizing patients when you are treating them and recognizing like their eyes or their face or their skin coloring because my daughter has gone through many physical therapies and none of them noticed it. <coughs> Myself and her two sisters are the ones who are trained to recognize of uh, and her service dog part um, are the ones to recognize um, the signs when she is going to hit the wall. And we try and stop her, because if not, then she will have a seizure. But physical therapists don't, and um, when she sees at the moment, and then they don't understand it. So the point being, thank you for recognizing that, and it is important to stop her beforehand, um, because it's too hard to bring it back, and it's very difficult. So it is important for the caregivers to say, hey, that's enough, and look for the signs. Um, but, but I, now I'm confused with everybody. Sorry. No, that was Was it okay? Thank you. Yes, it was. Okay. I want to say something. Yes. Um, we've had some doctors suggest file feedback. Have you guys had any experience with that? We didn't really pursue it because it's very expensive. <laughs> so uh, I was just curious whether you guys have had any training on that or if that's something you utilize. That is not something that I have specifically had training on it. And the problem is that there's not a lot of research out there. So I think a lot of times why it's recommended is that they're wanting people to try it to try to see if they can gather research. And I want to go back a little bit to the question that you had. Um, a lot of people will ask us, well, why are the practice acts for physical and occupational therapy so different than speech pathology? And I really think it goes back to the beginning of our presentation, is that as working on the cognition versus the language, it's very important for us to know what part of the, part of the brain that we're addressing. And even though the injury may have progressed and may have changed and there may have been improvement, we have to make sure that we target the right areas to really be successful. And so that doesn't mean to not speak to the right physician to ask for the referral, but it does mean that we get the right medical history and all of the information so that we can put that in our report to really justify the need for the continued therapy. We just want to echo, and you guys are of the crop about knowing about working as a team and I'll go to your point about fatigue and one of the things that I have been fortunate enough in my career to work with a lot of really great physical and occupational therapists that have taught me so much about their discipline but how we communicate to one another over the team including the patient including the family all of those things that you mentioned really helps us to come up with a plan that's going to be successful. And yeah, we might have insurance barriers that are going to limit our, 
our number of visits, but if we're in communication with one another and we're able to share that information, maybe we're able to address things a little bit quicker so that we're not asking the same questions over and over. Um, as y'all know, prognosis with this type of diagnosis is sometimes very unknown. And one of the reasons that neuropsychologists will often refer to speech therapy is they don't really know whether or not the compensatory strategies are going to work which is why I always say we have to try, and if we try certain things and it doesn't work, then we have to maybe try something else. We're not gonna know until we try. Um, I've talked about communication, but as you guys have all asked various questions, um, sometimes we don't get, if it's more of an acute encephalopathy, we may not get a referral for all three therapies. So I just wanna reiterate that we, want to take what families tell us, what a patient tells us, so that we can make those referrals for those other therapies. Um, and I guess that's what I would leave you with, is knowing that you have the ability to advocate and speak up if you're noticing certain things that are impacting you, because maybe that occupational therapy will actually make a big difference, and that adds into furthering you along with your long-term goals. Are there any other questions in the room?